All right, so uh, I always uh, find that story interesting, you know, those two guys thinking, hey, you know, we want to be right up front, you know, <laughs> look at us, we're sitting here by Jesus, you know, and of course the other ten get upset with them, you know, why them, why do, why do you think you guys are so, and just that strife that, you know, ambition, I guess, causes, and we've all seen it, I'm sure, in, in different walks of life that we've been in, you know, the uh, even the household, the, you know, office spaces, anywhere, uh, you know, it's always that struggle to, to be noticed and to, and to be lifted up. So it's going to be a good lesson because when we think of greatness, we often think of people with power, position, or popularity. Uh, for instance, and this is in the book, and I, I was almost hesitated to read it, but at least in times past, we, you know, the President of the United States will come to mind. You know, and, and at least the position, you know, uh, nowadays, no matter what you think, or the previous president, people had varying opinions, but we should uh, respect and honor that, that position. We should pray for them. And often, we do get caught up and think, boy, that, that's a great man, you know, or he's doing great things for the country. And, that, and, we, and we like to elevate people like that, and we certainly can do it with uh, other uh, people in our lives, you know, teachers. Uh, uh, you know, uh, bosses, anything like that, that people are, well, this is a, a great person. And, and we think of them because they have so, a position and they might have some power and, or they might be very popular. Well, uh, we may think of a social media influencer, someone who, because of their popularity, recommends a product and starts a trend just with a single picture posted online. You know, hopefully, uh, as Christians, we get over that pretty quickly. You know, uh, nothing can make me sadder than when you hear of the, uh, some uh, sports figure being held up as an example, you know. And, and what do we see? They always fail, almost always. You know, they fall. Uh, when, when we tend to put people on pedestal, they really do not belong there. There's only one that belongs there. Well, in our text, we find Jesus' disciples seeking personal ambition and glory. Thinking that Christ was going to establish an earthly kingdom, James and John asked Jesus if they could share the limelight by sitting at his left and his right on, while he is on his throne. They sought preeminence and wanted to secure chief positions for themselves. Jesus responded by telling them that the request was not his to give but at the will of his father. James and John's quest for special privilege got the other disciples angry, revealing the selfish nature of their hearts. You know, they, you know, it doesn't that, uh, maybe they had some right to get angry, but it's the same thing, you know, why not us? You know, they're all kind of starting to vie for position. If the top honor was to be given, they wanted it for themselves as well. Well, sad to say most of us would have probably reacted the same way. Because we, too, tend to desire greatness and recognition. And we, too, tend to define it in similar terms as the disciples, position and popularity. Jesus dealt with a core problem that the disciples and all of us have, self-centeredness. He did this by pointing out the world's mistaken idea of greatness and teaching them that his view of greatness is the opposite of ours. There on your worksheet, Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12. He said, but that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased or brought down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Jesus confronted the incorrect view that the one who has the servants and the maids is the one who is great. He reprimanded the disciples for acting like the rulers of the Gentiles. He compared them to the Gentiles that rule it over the people and lord it over their subjects. True greatness, Jesus explains, lies in servanthood. The greatest man is the humblest servant. One author said, quote, The great leaders of men in all fields have not been the arrogant and the greedy, but the servants. The real servants are the true nobility. The greatest of all, the Son of God himself, declared that he had come not to be served, but to be a servant and to give his life a ransom for many." Unquote. 
Our sinful, selfish nature causes us to want our way. We want others to serve us. We want to feel self-important. But if we are going to be great in the way Jesus defines greatness, and if we will make an impact on others as Christ would enable us to do, we need to learn to serve. A truly humble man is hard to find. Yet God delights to honor such selfless people. This Booker T. Washington, I'm sure you've heard his name, the renowned black educator, he was an outstanding example of this truth. Shortly after he took over the presidency of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, he was walking in an exclusive section of town when he was stopped by a wealthy white woman. Not knowing the famous Mr. Washington by sight, she asked if he would like to earn a few dollars by chopping wood for her. Because he had no pressing business at the moment, Professor Washington smiled, rolled up his sleeves, and proceeded to do the humble chore that she had requested. When he was finished, he carried the logs into the house and stacked them by the fireplace. A little girl there recognized him and later revealed his identity to the lady. The next morning, the embarrassed woman went to see Mr. Washington in his office at the Institute and apologized profusely. It's perfectly all right, madam, he replied. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. She shook his hand and uh, warmly assured him that his meek and gracious attitude had endeared him and his work to her heart. Not long afterward, she showed her admiration by persuading some wealthy acquaintances to join her in donating thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute. I thought, that's just so, you know, you never know how some small act of kindness, what effect it's going to have down the road. You know, just by being humble and, and, and doing some bit of service for someone. And we've probably all heard stories of, of people coming to the Lord because of that. Somebody just reaching out and being nice to somebody. Boy, that, that was, you know, just some special, some, we just think it's some little thing. You're not a big thing, but it's still that uh, willingness to do it and to reach out to someone. The path to greatness of a servant can be reached through a series of four counterintuitive steps. Number one there is to make an individual choice. Make an individual choice. Since serving others did not come naturally, we have to choose this identity. It is a personal decision, an individual choice. Verse 43 of our text says, whosoever will. And verse 44, whosoever of you will. Look again there on the worksheet, Mark 10, uh, 43 and 4. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. The use of the word will implies that we need to make a choice. You know, we say we exercise our will. You know, that, that's, that's a choice. We're, we're choosing to do that. When Jesus came to earth, he did so voluntarily. He did not have to but he chose to. Despite knowing that the hour of his death was near, he chose to continue serving his disciples and demonstrate his love for them by washing their feet. The story is there, John 13, on the worksheet 1 through 5. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God. He riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Wow, you think here is these last hours, and what's he do? You know, probably lots of things that, you know, other great men might have wanted to do or proclaim or talk to people, but Jesus got out a towel and washed his disciples' feet. 
you know, uh, just was able uh, here recently to go to a wedding. And instead of lighting the candles together or pouring the sand together, uh, they decided to wash each other's feet. And I thought, you know, I hadn't seen that, but it was such a touching and, and symbolic moment. It, it was really good. You kind of, well, that sounds weird, but it was, it was truly, really a neat thing to do. So, uh, you know, you can't get much more humble than washing the dirt and, and sand and dust off somebody's feet. Well, <clears throat> another gentleman, as a young boy, Dr. Henry A. Ironside helped his widowed mother who worked for a Christian cobbler. This cobbler plastered sheets of Bible verses all over the walls of his little shop so that his customers could see and read the word of God. In every package to his customers, he included a gospel track, and he would often share with them about salvation. Young Ironside's job was to pound water out of the soles of the, uh, that the cobbler had soaked. He pounded until they were hard and dry, and he would then nail them onto the shoes. The process was tedious and time-consuming, and Ironside wished for an easier method. On his way home, he came across the cobbler who fastened the wet soles on the shoes without hammering out the water. The cobbler's reason for this was, the customers come back quicker this way. And I stopped thinking, you know, I've been to some car repair shops, and I swear, you know, they fix the one thing and unplug three others, you know? And I go, because it seems like you have to go back the next week. You know, those little lube shops, I, t I swear, every time I went in, something went wrong with my car. And anyway, uh, they come back quicker. Ironside told his boss about this faster method, but his Christian employer took out his Bible and read, Whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all to the glory of God. He went on to say, hammering might be tiresome work, but I will not allow anything to go out of my shop that isn't well done. God has shown me how to cobble shoes, and I want to do it to glorify him. When I stand at his judgment seat one day, I expect him to inspect each pair of shoes that I've worked on, and I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So that's really good, you know, and we are. We're told to do all things for the glory of God and to keep that in mind. Well, no one can decide for you to be a servant. There may be authorities over you who can tell you what to do, uh, like your boss. You know, they, they have authority and you do uh, what they tell you to do, hopefully, to be in good employ. It, but compliance to instruction does not make you a servant. Just think, well, I listened to my, the orders. That, that doesn't make you a servant. You know, it's the attitude with which you do it. You know, not all, but and maybe not any, not very many uh, employees have a good attitude. You know, it seems to come along with being an employee. You know, you I was an employee, and you question what they're doing or wonder why, and you know, and pretty soon you get groups together talking about it, and you know, I've managed several people, and boy, it, you know, trouble can spread pretty fast. Now, they might do what you make them do, but that's not the good attitude you have. Well, I'll appreciate those that do it willingly and, and cheerfully. It's such a uh, good thing. So I'd encourage you this morning to be willing and to be cheerful with whatever we do. We only become servants when we choose on our own volition to humble ourselves and willingly serve others. Whosoever of you will, the choice is yours. And step two is to ask God for inward change. Ask God to change your heart. Even after we choose to serve, we do not immediately change from selfish to selfless. Neither can we bring about this change on our own, in our own hearts. The Bible tells us that this inward change is something only God can do in us. There in the worksheet, Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God that gives us to that. And God is more willing to give us a servant's heart if we ask him. You know, he wants to give us good things, but we have to ask for it. And then we have to accept it. In fact, he wants us to share the same mindset of Christ who humbled himself to be a servant, despite being God. 
He gave up his highest position of glory as the creator God to assume the lowliest position of a servant to his own creation. He went from creating it to being a servant of it. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 there. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wow. The verb let uh, means uh, to let this mind be in you, you know, let, to, to allow. You know, we need to allow that. The ver from that passage, let this mind be in you, the let means to allow. The verb tense is what they call passive imperative, which indicates that this is a choice that we make to allow something to happen to us. God desires to form the mind of Christ in us, and we are to allow him to do that work. He is willing. Are we willing to let him? It's a good question we each ask. A parallel example of this verb tense is found in Ephesians 5.18, which instructs us, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. Allow the Spirit to fill us. We make the choice to allow the Spirit of God to be in control. When we let the mind of Christ be in us, he causes us to think like he does. And that made me stop and think. Remember the wristbands that were real popular not that long ago? WWJD? You know, what would Jesus do? You know, the colorful wristbands and kind of help identify some people as Christians and, you know, might have different thoughts on that. But uh, I think the intention was good. You know, totally appropriate to, to keep in front of ourselves, our mind, what would Jesus do? Well, but first we need to learn to think like he would think. You know, we'd have to know what he's thinking in order to act like he would have us to act. Uh, our thinking, uh, because our thoughts determine our actions, right? We have to think of it first and then we do it. So thinking like Christ will result in acting like he does. So we need to know him and what he says about things. That's why we have his word. Romans 12, 2, there in your uh, worksheet. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Inward change begins with the mind. When we ask God to change us, he begins with the renewing of our minds. The Holy Spirit changes our way of thinking and conforms it to the mind of Christ. And as he changes our thinking, our behavior also changes to reflect more of Christ and less of ourselves. You know, I remember a time, uh, kind of a, uh, kind of a, it was over a little matter, but it was just really uh, a clarifying thing in my mind when, when uh, uh, dad had a disagreement with the pastor, his son. You know, is at a church long, long, long ago. And, uh, you know, I was trying to pull rank. You know, hey, kid, you know, you got to listen. And, and he stood up to me. You know, it was that time that I had to decide, okay, I'm going to follow the pastor and not, not what I wanted or what I thought was best. And you know, it's tough, you know, to have that relationship change. But, boy, it's just been a blessing ever since because, you know, he's the pastor. And I respect that and honor that. And... Uh, and then I don't have to worry about the stupid decision I would have made, you know. T turns out he was right. And I'm finding that more and more as I get older that the, the kid's right, you know. Now, not always. He's not perfect. But uh, anyway, it's just one of those things that we can learn. Can learn. I had the light bulb moment, as you will. So inward change begins with the mind. When we ask God to change us, he begins with the renewing of our minds. I have another gentleman here you've heard of, D.L. Moody. He understood that transforming work in the life of a Christian will manifest in an exaltation of Christ and debasement of ourselves. Moody quoted preacher and hymn writer, Dr. Horatius Bonar, who said he could tell when a Christian was growing. Quote, in proportion to his growth in grace, 
he would elevate his master, talk less of what he was doing, and become smaller and smaller in his own esteem until, like the morning star, he faded away before the rising sun. Jonathan was willing to decrease that David might increase, and John the Baptist showed the same spirit of humility, unquote. You know, just good lessons right from the Bible of people decreasing and, and increasing the Lord. All right, step three is to seek intentional connections. Intentional connections. Although sometimes opportunities to serve just land right in our pathway, serving others usually involves making a conscious effort. We have to make that choice. To minister to those in need, we have to get out of our comfort zone and purposefully meet the needs of others. Go forth with a purpose to meet needs. There are two different words in our text that both carry the idea of serving, but with two different points of emphasis. Recall Mark 10, 43 that said, uh, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. The word translated minister in verse 43 there is used to, in Acts 6 and is translated to serve, to serve minister to others, to serve others. Acts 6, 2 there on the worksheet. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Same word in the Greek as minister. The apostles then appointed deacons, servants who would minister to the widows of the church by serving tables. You know, I just so appreciate uh, the hardest service our deacons have here. You know, we can call any of them at any time and, and they will drop anything to serve others. You know, just a straight, it's just a great uh, thing to be around somebody that has uh, servant hearts and willing to do that. So if we are to minister to others, it means we will serve them. And like the deacons in Acts 6, we will need to go out of our way to meet the needs of others. But in verse 44 of our text, Jesus used a different word for being a servant. Uh, there on the worksheet, 1044, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. This word is translated from the Greek word doulos, which means bond slave. This was not just a person who looked for individual opportunities to serve. This was someone whose entire life was wrapped up in serving his master. He had chosen to give up his rights to his master, and he would seek nothing in return. So, we are to minister to others, but we are to do it from the posture of a servant. We are to look for and meet the needs of others, but we are to do it without the expectation of anything in return. And that is a key point. You know, if you're just willing to do it and forget it, that's the servant. You know, if we do something and say, wow, boy, I did this and they never paid me, they never thanked me, they didn't do anything. If we get that attitude, it can cause us then to to pull back from serving. It's just better to, to serve and be done with it. Do it for the glory of God. Let, we'll get our thanks in heaven from him, praise God. Jesus is our example in this. During his earthly ministry, Christ was always intentional about serving others. He expressed his love in action. He washed the feet of his disciples. He fed the multitudes, healed the sick, befriended the outcast, cast out demons, prayed for his disciples, and even laid down his life to save men. Matthew 4, 23 there on the worksheet says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And then Matthew 9, 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sick, uh, sickness and every disease among the people. You know, we just get the, he, he was always out there serving. You know, and, and there's a, another place. He says, you know, if, if we, he tried to write down everything he did, there wouldn't be enough room, you know, in, in, all the, in all the sea to hold all the things he did. He was just out there serving, being a servant. So how can you and I serve others? Service begins by being intentional to notice needs, but then we must follow through to minister to those needs. Again, this usually requires that we step out of our comfort zone. 
Look for a guest at church. Introduce yourself and make them feel welcome. We get a lot of compliments about that, and that's great. That, and you don't think of that probably as even being a service, but it is, just to make people feel welcome and noticed. Visitor, call a widow or a shut-in to encourage them with your fellowship. You know, our deacons are assigned widows, and, and they're given the list to check on every month and, and make sure their needs are met. But anybody else can do that, too. You don't have to have a deacon label just to do that. You know, if you think of somebody, God lays somebody in your heart. I mean, we've got several that are good, how busy, even as I look around the, uh, the room today, that go out of their way to, to make sure people are visited. Send a text, make a phone call to let someone know you're praying for them. Volunteer to help with a cleanup after a church event. I like that one. I hate cleaning up. <laughs> you know, but there's just things like, and you know, a lot of it, people are gone. It's unnoticed. Praise God. You're doing it for him. Write a note to your pastor to thank him for his ministry. Write a note uh, to a behind-the-scenes helper at church to thank them for their service. You know, sometimes we you just we take things for granted. You know, you, we walk in, the sanctuary is clean. You know, the tables are wiped down. You go, you think, oh, I wonder who did that. No, just kind of. We only notice it when it doesn't happen. You know, and it's just, it's good to think about some of the things going on back there. God created the church to be a body of believers who serve one another. For this purpose, he equips believers with spiritual gifts that they can use for the work of the ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 there says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He gave us all something to do. So are you serving your church family? Are you actively engaged in building up others through personal service to the church and for Christ? We should be. You know, uh, I just encourage you even now, to think if somebody comes to mind, uh, you know, just jot it on the, on the worksheet here and say, I'm going to you know, go home and call them this afternoon or this week. And just, I've got to lay somebody on your heart just to reach out to. It doesn't have to be a, a big thing, but, uh, you know, it's just uh, something we can do each week to, to just be a blessing to someone and to serve. Well, then step four is embrace the invaluable cause. The invaluable cause. Jesus gives a personal testimony of his ministry in verse 45 of our text. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's what he came for. Jesus could have demanded others to serve him. When you think about that, hello. He said, I am, and knocked down an art, you know, a legion of, of people in the garden. He could, do, he could make us do anything he wanted. But we are not robots, you know. When he came to earth, he chose to be born into a poor family in humble surroundings and then spent his life serving others. Ultimately, he served the entire world as he gave his life a ransom for many when he died on the cross for our sins and provided for us the gift of salvation. There on the worksheet, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him uh, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Wow. You know, might not be healed in this lifetime, you know, certainly have the body aches, and but we're going to get a glorious body because of what he did. No aches or pains, and oh, looking forward to that. Come quickly. Well, if Christ willingly gave his life to serve us, we should do no less than give our lives to serve him. Paul's gratitude for God's salvation motivated him to give up everything, surrender his life to serve God. He wholeheartedly embraced the cause of Christ. In Philippians 1.21, he summed up his calling in life. He said on uh, verse 120, uh, chapter 1, verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Wow. You know, 
And uh, I can certainly relate to that. You know, that's going to be a great gain. <laughs> you know, but we need to live for him now. To live as Christ. And then die is gain. And doesn't this picture look like fun? Not. I like my cruises in the Caribbean. Or, <laughs> you know, uh, somewhere warm. Well, the following advertisement occurred in the London newspaper. Quote, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Any, I don't see anybody rushing out of here to sign up for that one. But this ad was signed by Sir Ernest Shackleton, Antarctic explorer. Thousands responded instantly to the call. Not some, I don't know if that happened today, but thousands back then answered that ad. They were ready to sacrifice all for the elation of adventure and uncertain honor. But should God's children do any less? You know, we don't know maybe what we're getting into when we start serving him. And might, but might scare us and be worried about it, but his honor for us is certain. I like that. What would stop you from serving a God who has given his all to save you? Romans 12, 1 there says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know, he saved me. It's just reasonable to try to do something for him. You know, we like, we like returning favors, you know, for somebody who did something to us. You know, we say, oh, no, I owe you. I like people to owe me. Go, okay, you owe me. I like that. But, you know, God just was willing to do that. And it's just reasonable for what he's done for us. We can never really totally repay him, obviously, for giving us eternity. But we can certainly do what he asks. Some give their lives to serving their country. Others give their lives to finding the cure for a disease. Yet others give their lives to ending poverty. People will give their lives to what they value the most. As Christians who have received the invaluable gift of salvation, should we hesitate in giving our lives fully to Christ? Jesus taught us that the way we give ourselves to him is by serving others. Yeah. And, uh, and this was just really exciting to us. You know, last week we had our first, first steps meeting where we had the lunch and the pastors and, and had people that were interested in serving the church uh, come out. Uh, 23 people signed up. 73 boxes were checked. That's just our first first steps meeting. Just praise God. You know, it was just so exciting to have, you know, and that was before the Sunday school class. I expect a lot more at the next one. And, and, uh, but it's just exciting that people do want to give back and to serve God. It's, part, uh, it's exciting to be part of a church that looks to do that and looks for opportunity. So in conclusion, are you seeking greatness? Remember that the world's definition of greatness is the opposite of Jesus Christ's. Jesus said, the greatest is the servant of all. God's honor is given to the lowly, not to the lofty. The opportunities to serve others are all around you. Will you humble yourself, follow the steps of your Savior, and minister to the needs of others? May God help each of us this week to be on the lookout for opportunities to serve and to respond as Jesus would. Let's pray. Father God, we do uh, thank you again for uh, the challenge that your word can bring to us, especially in this area of service. Lord, it is our nature to want to be waited on and to be served and, and to, to sit back. But Lord, I pray that you would help us all get a little bit out of our comfort zone and reach out and serve. Uh, just if it's in a kind word or a phone call, Lord, that, uh, that we can do, or even just to pray for people is a great service that you can give us to do. Oh, Lord, just help us to respond to that this morning. Lord, uh, that we would learn to uh, be, have a servant's heart and to be humble and not look for anything in return, but to graciously and wonderfully and with cheerfulness serve you. 
So we thank you for that lesson uh, this morning. Lord, we pray for uh, the sermon to come. Just lift uh, our pastor up to you for, to bring your words of encouragement and challenge to us even further as he talks about your own words that I am the good shepherd. Lord, we look forward to that with anticipation as, as always to what you have to say to us through the preaching of your word. Prepare our hearts now as fertile ground to take uh, that seed in and to grow it into service and honor for you. So we ask all these things in Jesus' precious, wonderful, and glorious name. Amen. Well, uh, next week, as I said, I'm getting done early, but next week, uh, it's another tough one. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Boy, uh, the, the enemy list seems to be growing, so our love ought to be growing. Amen? <laughs> That's a tough one. So come back next week and be challenged to love your enemies, and we will do that.